Don't worry, lad. Guys, we're in charge. It's all going very well. Let, let's start this proper then. There's, yes. there's the shenanigans. <laughs> Sun's <laughs> out, puns out, Tom. Start with your favourite vermouth pun. A vermouth? You can't handle vermouth. Oh, it's an oldie. You can. You can, because we are... We didn't plan this weather, obviously, but what uh, a balmy evening like this is perfect vermouth weather. A aperitif, aperitivo weather. So we have with us this month the wonderful Janina Bolchin, who is it Balchin or Bolchin? It's Bolchin, but it doesn't Bolchin, really matter. Janina Bolchin, um, who uh, is the founder of In the Loop Drinks, who makes not only a lovely range of uh, in all English vermouths, but uh, it also makes some ready to drink cocktails, which uh, in a future life we might come back to. But we're concentrating on vermouth now. Um, and we, Tom and I, have been banging the drum, not as loudly as Janina, but about ver vermouth for quite a while because as we're getting older and we, we want to drink it less but drink better, the alcohol volume on a vermouth is considerably lower. But not only that, it's often being cast as a kind of cameo role in cocktails rather than a drink you particularly would enjoy on its own or, or lengthen. And it's, um, and it's a wonderful revelation. There's some wonderful vermouths out there and more and more people are making them. And, it's just, uh, and we're big fans of it. But we've yet to taste one on the, on the, on the club. And uh, Janina bumps into my brother at a food festival, I believe who's on the call, Barney Musician. He told me about them, and then we kind of got in touch, and then we went and met at, uh, after our show in Brighton, which was back in May, and it's taken us this long, mainly due to our incompetencies to get to get this uh, show on the road. But anyway, without further ado, uh, welcome, Julian. Thank you very much for giving your time and your lovely vermouth. Um, firstly, what tell us about how this came about. And okay. the whole the whole story. Okay, I'll try to keep it relatively brief. Um, but I am a winemaker by trade. So I went to Hampton College, like mostly everybody that's in the English wine industry, and did a master's degree in enology and viticulture. I was working in an English winery for a few years, and they make a vermouth, although I was not privy to the recipe. And one day someone asked me why anybody would ever want to make vermouth. And I put up a pretty good fight and then thought, why am I not making vermouth? Um, and there we are, the business was born. So I created it in 2019. And the whole concept was about keeping English wine in the circular economy. So we are called In The Loop Drinks because we're keeping English wine in the loop. That was the whole kind of concept. It was basically because the English wine industry is growing really fast and there's a lot of English wine out there. It's all got to go somewhere and some of it goes into making my lovely vermouth. So that is it in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to tell you guys what English vermouth actually is because that's the number one question I always get. Uh, so it's aromatized fortified wine. So it's wine based. Um, a lot of people think it's a spirit, but it actually sits in the fortified wine category. Um, and I take English wine, I increase the alcohol to 16%. So Ben was right when he said that, you know, relatively speaking, it's a lower alcohol product, really. Um, and then I flavor with a lot of botanicals, most of which I grow myself and forage for. So you tend to find vermouth and gin go in a lot of cocktails together because they have a similar botanical nature, but a different base ingredient. So they balance each other nicely in cocktails like a martini or a Negroni. And there's many, many others as well. Uh, so that is what vermouth actually is. And we're going to taste through three tonight. Um, should I ask if anyone has any specific questions at this point? Yeah, yeah let's, let's, well, let's go, th let's go through, th through them one by one, because I suspect we'll get through, questions will sort of emerge as we're tasting it. So which one are we going to taste first? The white. Think? So we're going to start with the dry white vermouth. I've got a bottle here, but I know you guys have pouches. So I don't know how it was labelled, but yeah, dry white. Dry vermouth. White, white on it. White. white. Okay. It's the one that says white. Okay, that's what we're going to do. This is what the bottle looks like, um, just in case anybody was interested. So it's dry white vermouth. Um, and it is, uh, yeah, and it's in a sort of like a gin style bottle actually with a screw cap closure. Uh, and that's the loop. So it's like the whole like in the loop thing. So it's got a loop in it. But that's what the dry white one looks like. So we're starting with that. Um, 
Okay. Go ahead and pour myself some. Yeah, now I think one of the things that's interesting about vermouth is for for centuries, since it sort of was conceived as a style of drink um, across Europe and then made popular in Italy, it, it tends to be put into two different camps, a sort of dry style and a sweet style. And we have perhaps erroneously uh, considered the, the sweeter styles to be Italian and the dry styles to be French. But that's, I mean, obviously English vermouth is busting all of those myths as is German vermouth, and vermouth that's emerging from other countries like Australia as well, the sort of new world vermouth. What is it that it specifically makes it dry and why is that not necessarily unique to French vermouth? Oh, okay, so there's categories, um, like there is in Champagne, when you call something brew or extra brew or whatever, it has to hit a certain sugar content. So you can have you can have a red base wine, you can have a white base wine, you can have a an amber base wine, which we're going to have as well tonight. Um, and oh, sorry, Sandra and Frank, could you just sit yourself on mute, guys, just because you're um, you're coming through? Or Ben, can you? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, okay. Thanks, Sorry, this this setup wasn't how we planned it. We were planning to to be down in um, Sussex this evening, but I don't know if anyone's heard about the weather. <laughs> it's just it's ruined everything, <laughs> a bit like COVID. Um, so thanks for being on mute, guys. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. So it doesn't matter whether it's white, red, rosé, whatever color the base wine is. The the uh, the labelling, so dry or semi-dry or semi-sweet, it's just purely dictated by the sugar content. So, I mean, I personally think that a white wine lends itself more to being dry and a red wine lends itself more to being sweet. Uh, um, I've found that to be the case with English vermouth because English base wines, a lot of the reds that I'm coming across aren't quite right to be table wines in their own right but make really good vermouth once you add a little bit of sugar. They're just missing that little bit of sweetness. So for English vermouth, it just seems natural to me that the white stuff is dry and the red stuff is sweet, but there's no, there's no law to say, you know. I mean, there are regulations when it comes to vermouth and there are certain things I have to follow, but it doesn't matter. I don't have to match a certain color wine to a certain sugar content. Well, that, yeah. that, the, just the conversation about wine is quite interesting because Again, originally, when we go back to the 1800s, when they were coming up with these drinks, they were taking uh, inferior wines, weren't they? The, the wines that you wouldn't necessarily drink, and they were adding these botanicals to them to give them a sort of second lease of life in a way. But what seems to be happening in more recent times, and I'm sure you will be championing this, is the fact that the wine itself that's at the heart of the vermouth is as important as all the botanicals and things you're putting into it now. Is that fair? Yeah, I'm getting I'm I'm getting better at learning what makes a good vermouth base wine. It's a difficult thing to taste for because you're tasting a wine and imagining what it's going to be like once you've added a load of stuff. Um, but I'm getting better at tasting it. And the ones that are good tend to be quite flavorful, which in the English wine industry is uh, useful because when you're making an English sparkling wine, you want quite a neutral base wine so that when you do secondary fermentation, it takes on all those nice aromas of secondary fermentation. So in a lot of cases for me, I am using the stuff that's not quite right. It's not inferior. It just isn't right for the purpose it was created for. So it might be that it has too much flavor to be an English sparkling wine. What tends to happen a lot in the UK, because we are still a young wine industry, is that a winery has tried something out. It's not quite worked as they would want. And they've ended up with a wine that isn't in the style to fit within their range. And that tends to be the stuff that I take and make the move from. So I am really kind of trying to keep it in the loop. Um, and that was the whole idea. And there's so much stuff out there. I mean, it's the reason I created the business. I could see how much wine there was going to be. And I mean, this year, yeah, I mean, we've still got a few months to go before harvest, but um, it's looking like it's going to be a good good old yield this year so that's mm. going to be good news for me in a few years time mm. so when we're tasting this what are the sorts of things we're looking for what's the what, when you forage for your botanicals and you put them in there obviously wormwood is is essential by that is one of the the laws isn't it in terms it of yeah. percent wine must contain wormwood and then you can mm -hmm. add a certain amount of sugar they, they're the, the key restrictions so you put wormwood in there and what else is there 
Okay, so the wormwood is fresh, so I grow it myself. I should have brought Woody up here. He's in a pot, so I could have brought him up here, although he does leave a bit of a mess. Uh, so I grow it myself, and then it's got fresh bay leaves that I've grown, fresh lemon verbena that I grow. It's got a bit of oregano in there that I've grown. So this is the UK's first all English vermouth. So it's English wine and only English botanicals. And I'm the first one to do this. I just thought, well, if you're gonna have an English wine that reflects the terroir, really you should be putting English botanicals in there that you've also grown from the land. So it's all just English stuff. It's got some camomile in it that's grown down in Cornwall and a load of gorse flowers that I pick off the Ashdown Forest because I'm um, in Uckfield, so East Sussex. So the Ashdown Forest is quite close. And I pick a lot of botanic, a lot of gorse flowers off the Ashdown Forest and it is awful job. It is an awful, awful job because those bushes are damn spiky but it's really worth it and you get a very sort of fresh melon flavored um extraction from it and so, so when you're picking the gorse what what the, so they're berries surrounded by thorns are they or they're they're flowers it's they're flowers, flowers so, yeah and i picked the whole flower and there's a bit of an act to it because the thorns are just oh they're evil there's a bit of an act to it but i basically pick from the ends and i get more flowers and less stabby <laughs> I could do it for about an hour before my fingers go numb. Right. Yeah. So that really is, <laughs> it's quite. But originally, um, um, Paul has asked, how, how did vermouth come about? Was it one of those classic mistakes? Um, no. So it was, originally. It was medicinal, wasn't it? Originally? Yeah, it was. So in 400 BC, Hippocrates made wormwood wine. So he basically put wormwood in wine. And it was for um, to relieve digestive ailments. So it was for, it was to improve digestion. So vermouth is like super old school. Like we think of like, you know, I don't know, the 70s or whatever. And what were those two people that did those adverts? Jane Collins and... Oh, uh, Campari. And a, Martini. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. But I mean, vermouth is like much, much, much older than that. Um, yeah, so it's been around for a long, long time. And it is the wormwood in it. So wormwood being a natural... Um, Ada of digestion has meant that vermouth has found its place being drunk before or after dinner to either get your body ready to to eat or to help once you've eaten so it's it's kind of almost been a bit functional in that respect um so yeah it's been around for a long 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 time I mean, although that's the dry we tend to think of the dry vermouth to go, going into mixed drinks but that is a it's very drinkable and actually I can imagine having that with some ice and a, a, a tonic water or as alternative, a lower ABV alternative to gin almost, because it's got all of those botanicals in it. But it is that, I mean, did you make it with that in mind, thinking this is just a cocktail ingredient, like a lot of dry vermouth? Yeah, I've tried to create a range of what I call sipping vermouths, so the sort of thing you could just drink, sit and drink on their own. I mean, the white I would drink chilled, no ice, but nice and cold. Um, especially in weather like this. I mean, as a simple serve, you're right, bit of tonic water does the trick. You don't need to do anything complicated with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, my vermouth style is very wine-led, and I think that just comes from my background. Mm. I like the botanicals to be in there and for you to taste them, but for me, they're a function of the wine. I want them to support the wine flavours and kind of enhance them. Um, yeah, and the other thing I've done is to not make them too bitter. There's a lot of vermouth out there that's really bitter, and that's fine. I mean, they have their place as well. They add a really nice bit of bitterness to certain cocktails. But for me, you then wouldn't want to sit and drink it on its own, because for me, that it's a slightly unpleasant thing to have that bitterness. So I've tried to create something that is just easy drinking, um, but that's just a bit different to wine, a bit more aromatic, but then also versatile enough that you could use it in a martini, mixed with tonic, uh, in a tuxedo or whatever, there's loads of cocktails out there. We've got well, the, one, the, the, the we've suggested we were, one. We, um, the, the success of the aperitivo, we've been doing quite a lot of work and writing about the aperitivo um, history, and um, especially in Italy, and we were in France recently, and we went to a distillery in Provence, and they make a lot of aperitif wines, and um, it's amazing when you go down there, and there's lots they just make so many drinks designed for that moment when you finish, when you sit down after a day at work or, and, uh, and it's your first drink of the evening. And, you, you know, the idea being you sat on a terrace and it's, 
It's lovely and warm. Um, and apart from today, that very rarely happens in, in the UK. But then you look at stuff looking like the success of the Aperol Spritz, and spritzes have been massive, haven't they? I mean, everyone's launching essentially uh, 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 spritz-style drinks. Um, and I do think now people are realising that actually that is quite a nice thing to have. Um, to have there is a, a sort of more people are having that moment and it's been a gin and tonic moment for so long but with a vermouth with a vermouth drink it's just it's perfect it's perfect with that long uh um a, where we whether we're doing a pair is it a pear teeny we're making well yeah today? Didn't we, we, make... we were going to try and make some drinks weren't we and um i think the first one Janine, you're going to have a go at yeah. doing it. Yeah, yeah, I can knock off a quick pad teeny. Oh, I have everything in front of me. Okay, right, I'm going to do this super fast and then try not to drink all of it because it's quite a big step. So uh, I have a cocktail shaker here with some ice that's a bit more water than ice now, but that's fine. And I'm going to add some gin. So I'm using my little jigger. These are available on the website. Oh, they? oh, very sexy. Nice. They're very cute. I like these a lot because I follow quite a lot of recipes on the Diffus Guide. And the Diffus Guide often calls for like odd measures of stuff. Mm. So this has got lots and lots of lines in it. It's not just a standard Japanese jigger. So it's got like 10 mil, 30 mil. There's a 60 mil measure in there. So I'm going to use that. I'm going Brighton gin tonight um, because I love the Brighton gin. I use it in my ready to drink cocktail range. So I'm using that. So I'm going 50 ml of gin, if anyone's following along, uh, which is a significant amount. There we are. There's a double shot of that. 25 ml of the dry vermouth. So I will just say at this point, because I am a vermouth maker, my martinis are very wet. None of this, swirl the glass, throw it out, nonsense. I want that vermouth in there. So I'm going 25 ml of the dry white vermouth. So just to, um, just to clarify, a dry martini. Uh, uh, martini is all about the balance between a, a, the gin or the vodka and the vermouth. If you want it dry, you go very easy on the vermouth. Winston Churchill had a, his martinis very dry, um, but it was said it was because he had disdain for the French, um, and he. But it was because they couldn't get hold of it during the war. Is that right, Tom? That's what I've heard. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. They, That's right. they, there was a there was a suggestion that he would swill the martini glass uh, with gin, then go to the vermouth, but then swear in the direction of France um, and completely ignore the vermouth. But I think it was just one of those um, British things that came about that we hate the French, but we don't hate the French, do we? No. Uh, we don't hate the French. And uh, actually Churchill didn't hate the French either and, and quite liked vermouth, but... Um, yes, you're right. There was a short supply of a lot of things during the war. Yeah. Uh, sweets, vermouth, all sorts of stuff. Um, <laughs> I, 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 pre, I pre-made it. I'm going to stir mine. Look at this. Look at this spoon. Oh. oh. I just That's good. Oh. I've got standard. Yeah. Thing. That's because I'm cooler than you, I think. I think people yeah. agree. Yeah, well, I, could, I knew that already. <laughs> so my, after my the... <laughs> but we're stirring, After aren't the, we? Yeah, we're stirring. We're, we're not stirring. Shaking. We're don't, We're not shaking. The only martini you're supposed to shake is the Vespa, which is the classic James Bond martini. That's the whole shake and not stirred. That's the only one you're supposed to shake, right? Because you want those ice crystals to splinter and dilute the vast amount of alcohol that's in a Vespa. But everything else you want to gently stir. So after the gin and vermouth, I added a little bit of pear syrup. This is the one I really like. It's by um, Simply. They're just really nice, quite fresh flavoured syrup. So it's the pear syrup, so 10 ml of that. Where did you get that then, from, Janina? Where is that available? Is that in... I use a website called A2 Coffee Supplies. It's the cheapest place I can get it, but I tend to order in quite large quantities because I use different syrups for different things. Uh, it works out much cheaper, but, you know, they're great and they deliver really fast. But the range is massive. There's loads of different flavours. And they're really nice when you're starting out making cocktails. You can, you can just add a splash. So I've got a rose one. I've got loads. I've got loads of different ones, and it's nice for just adding a splash of of a flavour and a little bit of sweetness. So we've got some pear syrup in there, and then uh, normally a squeeze of lemon, but I don't have any lemon, and I'm not going out in this weather, so I've gone for a squeeze of lime. I'm just going to stir that and uh, strain it into my martini glass. Hold the ice back. Um, 
don't know where my strainer is. So, oh, hello. I'm just going to use the top of my thing. And my martini glasses are quite big. These are... Right, yeah, why not? Yeah, these are the Dartington ones. They're like my favourite. And my martini is a large. I'll show you actually how big. So it's, oh God, it's completely filled my martini glass. There you oh, go, yeah. lovely. Cheers, everyone. Mm. Cheers. I'm using these. That is for, a... um, it perfectly fills one of those coops as well. Mm. Um, and these are the baby sham ones, Ben. I've you got remember? one of those as well, Tom. They they went through a phase in the bar industry. I think it was Hicks's bar in um, uh, underneath his Mark Hicks's <laughs> restaurant, where he came across a load of these, and suddenly bartenders went crazy for them because they're almost the perfect size for a a martini. So, oh, that is really delicious. That is, yeah. Oh, crikey. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. tend I mean, to pear find... Syrup, um, pear syrup is quite hard to make as well, so it's quite, that's quite a good tip to just... I mean, I love the idea of making all your syrups fresh, but unless you're serving up 50 people and you're not going to get through it all, really, so um, no. that's good. Yeah, there's so many out there. Um, it's just a really nice way, yeah, like I said, to add a little bit of flavour. I've got a lemon one at the moment and an orange one. They do a rhubarb one. Oh, they do, they do so many. And they're nice as well. They're not, um, they don't taste too fake, you know? Right. Mm, good. Um, well, really. Let's move on because I've got a mate. Um, Jono wants the website for the syrups again. It's um, A2 Coffee Supplies. A2. It's the coffee websites. Yeah, it's the coffee websites that tend to do a lot of these syrups. It's either A1 or A2. A2 what? A2. A2. Coffee supplies. Do you want me to write it in the chat? I've, I've yeah, A1, A1 Coffee Net. Is that? Is that it A1? Mean? I always get it mixed up. A1. Apologies. A1 A1 coffee one. Net. Yeah. I think that's it. A1 A1 one, one of my favourite. Uh, uh, right. I'm going <laughs> to move on. It's a good one, Ben. You're right. The A1, really, I mean, it, it's an it's underestimated. Awesome. It goes right up to the north, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Watford uh, Gap. Now, we're going to... Summer edition. Now, having tasted all three, I, I think this is my favourite. I know it's limited edition, okay. but I really like this one. Yeah, I mean, I like it too. It was just such a pain to make. I'm just not doing it again. I like this one. That's pretty um, honest. <laughs> It was, okay, so what I did was I picked a lot of flowers for it because I was trying to evoke the essence of summer meadows. And um, all the flowers I picked were really, really small. It took me forever and a day because I picked them all and washed them. So things like rosemary flowers, the bay leaf bush flowered, so those flowers went in, uh, heather flowers, borrowed flowers, again, the gorse flowers. And the idea was that with things like rosemary flowers, the flower gives a flavour that's a bit like rosemary, but without the green. So it's a, like a lighter version of the same flavour. So I got obsessed with flowers for a bit, made the summer edition vermouth, and it is lovely and it's very delicate. It works very well with tonics, so just bubbles really help open up a little bit. That's all it needs. That's what it was designed for. Summer spritzes, that's it. Um, and yeah, it's uh, got an odd base wine as well. Again, I was just kind of having a bit of a, a trial. So it's a blend between a barrel aged Chardonnay and a Pinot Noir Rosé, just to really complicate things. Uh, so oh, it is a really odd one, this one. Um, and yeah, it's very limited edition. I've got about 50 bottles left. Um, it involves people, it's honestly. Yeah, it's, it's floral, but it is very delicate. And uh, there's still a sort of richness to it, which I guess is coming from the wines there that's, I mean, when you go out, when you go out and you, you look into something like that, you, what, where's the inspiration coming from? Because just putting a lot of flowers, it sounds quite an original idea in a lot of respects, maybe putting some floral ingredients, but to go really full tilt of the flowers. What was the thinking behind it? Did you, had you heard about that historically or was it just something you knew about innately? I'm just a genius. I don't know how I think. <laughs> no, it's not. No, I think what it was was that I'd already picked rosemary, I'd already picked bay leaves, I'd already sort of done that. And I'm a very kind of, um, I don't know what the word is, 
touchy feely gardener I'm the sort of person that when something like a rosemary flower I would just pick that and eat it and right. say okay that you know that's my sort of style of everything really um and just sort of give it a go I started my career in food science so before I was in wine I was a product developer in the food industry so I did a food science degree and I started off in food and I learned quite a lot in product development as kind of um ways of working ways to kind of develop things um and yeah I mean it just kind of it just felt like the most natural thing in the world I wanted to make a summer edition for vermouth I'll put some flowers in it I know what works already I'll just pick the flower version of that I mean it kind of just made sense to me I mean things like borage flowers traditionally you know they have a very cucumber taste my husband's a chef he grows them so that he can do some fancy garnish on stuff and I thought right I'll have a few of them you know, because I know this is a bit like cucumber and that's the sort of thing I was going for. Um, so I just kind of went with my gut instinct, I suppose. Mm. Can, you, can you make another incarnation of it that's l less of a hassle? Yeah, so at the same time that I did a summer edition, because uh, this, this summer edition is a few years old now, it was part of my original range. That's why it's still got the cork uh, top, because I, I, I went from using the cork tops to using the... The screw caps so that's still my original style bottle the same time I made that I made a rosé and it we used a Pinot Noir rosé base and the base wine was just a little bit stronger so it held a bit more flavour so I didn't need to pick so many delicate things but it still had a really lovely kind of dryness to it it still lent itself really well to a spritz and I put things in there that weren't so difficult to pick mm. so things like it had some re uh, fresh um, rose petals in it it had some wood sorrel that I'd picked from the Ashdown Forest after my dog disappeared down a ditch and I went after him and found a whole load of wood sorrel. Um, so that actually had a similar kind of, similar-ish kind of flavour style, but was easier to make. So if I can get around to making another limited edition, it will probably be a rosé rather than this, which is, is an amber. So it's kind of like similar, but a bit different. That sounds wonderful. Mm. That sounds a little bit, a bit of a twist on me as well. But we are making a cocktail with, well, I am making a cocktail with this. And I'm only rushing you because my mouth is melting. obviously melting <laughs> very quickly. I've got the so, third drink um, and it's this almost is, water. Um, <laughs> this is called the Tuxedo. And the recipe's on the website. Um, and it's, you've got, um, we've got a 50 ml of the summer edition. Hang on, I'm just, can you, can you, oh, look at that. I am wearing my pyjamas, by the way, but it's because it's so hot. Um, where's the, the jigger? So the jigger, you, you know, we talked about the jigger earlier. The jigger, as Tom and I say on our show, we discovered it's got 28 different meanings, as well as being a measuring device in English. And some of them are random, like a, a lathe, a door, a Ouija board, um, two of the other ones, a, a penis and a vagina, uh, a policeman. What else are they, Tom? I can't remember. Um, uh, a small way to hand car, flea. Uh, yeah, that's good practice for our Edinburgh show, because yeah. we've got to yeah, say yeah. those. Anyway, sure, 50 those, mil uh, of the uh, summer edition. And then we go for 25 mil uh, gin. I'm using Citadel uh, huh. from... France is very nice, quite strong, 44, but that's very aromatic as well. So I'll give a 25 of that. Then we've got a couple of dashes of orange bitters. A little bit made uh, earlier myself, thank you very much. Hang on, let me have a couple of dashes of that. Got some absinthe as well from last month. <coughs> Follow me, a couple of dashes. Hang on, am I doing this right? I'm just straying all in. That's yeah, that's I'm... all right. Just stir it round a bit. Just what, go yeah. easy on the absinthe. I'll go, don't worry. Because that's got wormwood in as well. Yeah. Or Tijon. So a couple... I think that's it? why wormwood got a bad rep for being hallucinogenic. I think it's got something to do with absinthe. Am I right? Yeah. It's Tijon, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah. Well, you'll know this, food science. So the Tujon in it, I'm stirring it up, and um, I'll sort of add a bit of... But Wormwood, in the Slavic translation for Wormwood, is um, Chernobyl, which is rather Wonderful. ominous. And then yeah. we're adding a little bar spoon of cherry liqueur. 
I haven't got a, a sort of one that goes in and out, but it's still quite impressive. Have you got any um, um, cherries for garnish? Okay. I'm just going to say, if you don't, I just put some more maraschino liqueur in it. It's one of my favourite. No, I haven't got maraschino. That's which is a bit of a, I know. Um, but uh, again, I wasn't going out in this weather to get it. But I had some cherries anyway. So you strain it into the baby sham glass. Uh, the first person to tell me what baby sham is wins, well, it doesn't win anything, just gets respect. Yeah, we've all got the internet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very well done. Very, yeah, it's cool. Very. Uh, Bar Bar there you Barnaby go. Just, uh, is, just quoted is your in and out. That's the in and out one, Barnaby, just for uh, that comment there. In and out, in and out. Oh, that is delicious. Great. That. Well done. Bonjour. Um, so there we go. Quite a versatile Again, another one. Another very. How long that didn't take any time at all? No. It's a nice, easy one. All the best cocktail recipes, I think, yeah. are easy. Yeah. It's amazing. I really didn't put I literally very, very little absinthe in there. But it makes itself known. Yes, it <laughs> really does. Yeah. This is something you can rinse a glass with, for sure. Yeah. It need a lot of it, does it? Oh, okay. Maybe that would be a better way to make the tuxedo. Rinse with the absinthe and then crap on after that that's yeah, actually yeah. not a bad shout um should we move on to the third vermouth so now we're going into <clears throat> sort of sweet but you suggest semi-sweet is that was that yeah, a deliberate it intention just it was you didn't i mean there can you can get some really obviously with the with the amount of sugar that you can add to vermouth it's quite it's quite a big range isn't it it's something like is it 30 grams per litre to all the way up to 140 grams? Or is that, it seems like from memory, okay. quite a lot you can add. Yeah, so uh, you've got the semi-dry category, which I think is your 30 to 80. Right. Semi-sweet is 90 to 130 right. grams per litre. So to put it into perspective, so my white has nine grams per litre of residual sugar. And that puts it in the dry category. The red has 90 grams per litre, so 10 times the amount, and puts it in the semi-sweet category. I was really, really certain when I created a semi-sweet red vermouth that I wanted it to be called semi-sweet and not semi-dry. And I know that sounds a bit funny, but semi-dry for me, I find a bit of a misleading term because it suggests a level of dryness when actually semi-dry can be almost 90 grams per litre of sugar, yeah. which is not in any way dry. No. It's already quite ah. sweet. So I thought, right, I don't want it to be super sweet because when you add sugar, you dilute flavour. And as I said, I work with quite flavourful base wines. I wanted to keep that flavour there. So I wanted to be able to be in the semi-sweet category, but kind of at the bottom end. So I pretty much hit that bottom level for sugar. So we're at 90 grams per litre. And it can go all the way up to 130 grams, I think it is. And after that is sweet. That's an awful lot of sugar. And it can make some really heavy vermouth. So like a lot of the Italian vermouth, they're sweet and they sit like that. And it works for them because they have quite full bodied Italian base wines. They've put the sugar in and it just works well and it feels natural. Because I'm working with English red wines, all of that sugar would have just swamped it it just wouldn't have worked with the flavors of the base wine you'd have ended up with some sort of red syrup it just wouldn't have been as good so I went semi-sweet because again I was working with the base wine and was sort of being dictated by the flavors that I found there so yeah that's it so it's 90 grams per litre semi-sweet rather than sweet you can use it in all the same ways that you would use a sweet red vermouth but there are some things that you should maybe consider so for example when I make a Negroni I just dial back on the Campari bit because it doesn't have the sweetness to support that much bitterness. So a classic Negroni is obviously equal parts gin, mm. vermouth and Campari. And I'll just go half the Campari because otherwise, for me, it's just way too bitter. It, yeah, the semi-sweet red just doesn't have enough sugar to balance that level of Campari. 
Um, but in all other ways, yeah, it's um, I very much I, I like this one a lot. And again, it's a sipping vermouth, so you could easily have this just over ice with a fresh slice of orange. This and is a pair of see tea. this, uh, Julia. That is the serve that I think is is the is the, such a good way of getting into the vermouth. It's so good over ice as it dilutes with a bit of fruit. It's absolutely brilliant. And it's so simple. And I just think uh, there's, there's, there's um, having, them in the, having them in the fridge for that reason alone is great. Did you know that um, uh, I was listening to an old Desert Island Discs with Gordon Ramsay, not my, not my favorite personality yet by any means, but he, they asked him what three, I think it was Desert, what three things would he always have in his kitchen? And uh, it was a, it was a super duper knife, uh, something else. I can't remember the second one. But then vermouth. He said vermouth in terms of cooking. He oh. said if you're ever doing a roast um, and, you, and you need to uh, get it sort of more moist and keep it going and uh, get some flavours in there, don't add white wine. Add vermouth. He says absolutely brilliant. And I started doing it, and it's amazing. It was really really good. Um, so it's good for. For, I mean, he 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 named he didn't name your vermouth, I'm afraid, but I think it was from 1996. So, uh, 1996, blimey, I'd have been five. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Come on, put your finger out. <laughs> um, Sinead, did you say what wine was in the red booth? Did I miss that? No, I didn't actually. So, no, so what's it's the base uh, wine? English, right? Okay, so the variety is Rondo. Okay, it's a German variety, goes very well in this country, at least it did. I don't know that it would in 40 degree heat. I don't really know. Well, so the climate, traditionally, if you look back 20, 30 years, we were growing German varieties in this country. And about 10 years ago, maybe slightly more actually, we started planting champagne varieties instead because the climate is starting to shift a bit, if you hadn't noticed. So Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier are the Champagne clones. So they're the most planted in the UK and the fourth spot has been held by Bacchus. It has maintained the fourth spot. Um, Rondo is one of these lovely German varieties that I would say, and this is just my personal guess, I wouldn't be surprised if people start putting it up in favour of planting the Champagne varieties. I, that's just a feeling. Um, but it does grow well in this country. It gives quite a full-bodied red wine. The problem is that the variety isn't particularly well known. And if the climate changes, you could probably get away with planting something that's better known that makes a good red wine. So for example, there's a vineyard down the road from here and they grow Merlot. I think they might, and they were the first to plant it. I think there's another one now, but uh, you know, so you could plant something like that. But anyway, that's another thing. The variety is Rondo. Gives a full-bodied red wine, obviously in the right conditions last year. It would not have done because last year was awful. Uh, and then it's got some fair trade vanilla in it, some uh, Tonka beans, which is one of my favourite, favourite things in the entire world, and uh, fresh Spanish orange peel. So I did originally try to grow things that I could use mm. to mix with the wine, like I had done with the white in the summer and other ones I've done previously. Um, I just couldn't, I couldn't make anything that was had enough flavour. Um, I, you know, sort of looking around for an alternative to vanilla and thought, well, what I really want is vanilla. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to use yeah. that. There's not, there's not many things that taste like vanilla that are vanilla. Yeah, so there's <laughs> actually, so there's, um, yeah. there's, a, there's a bush uh, that looks a bit like gorse and it has very similar yellow flowers on it, but no thorns. And it's called, um, I always get this wrong, it's either brush or broom. And it's where we get the saying, uh, like to use a brush, like the it's got the same meaning. And it's because people used to brush their their floors with it. Mm. Um, yeah, you might have to Google that. I'm pretty sure I've got that right. It's either called brush or broom. Anyway, the flowers used to be used to flavor custard back before we could get vanilla. Oh. But the, the problem is it has a very faint vanilla flavor. It's nowhere near as punchy as the vanilla that we can get hold of nowadays. I'd have had to use an awful lot of it. I've got one brush that I know of that's just down the way I'd have had to completely strip that and I still don't think I would have had enough so I just went with vanilla tonka beans there's nothing else in this world like tonka beans um they're very complex in flavor they grow on big 
uh, evergreen trees in South America, <clears throat> they have a very complex flavor that's a bit like vanilla, uh, a bit like chocolate. But most interestingly for me, sometimes you get something that's almost a bit like petrol. And I love mm. petrol notes in a red wine. It's one of my favorite things. Four star diesel. <laughs> the dirtier the better two stroke no i don't know <laughs> but um yeah so i was like right tonka beans going in there um and uh yeah fresh spanish orange peel make it really makes the vermouth really suited for a negroni mm. we've got um we've got the cocktail that you you you, uh, you recommended which was this grapefruit one um, and look what I've done in preparation for this. Now, I did go out and get a grapefruit, but it was really small. So this is going to be, so this is going to be really interesting. Sort of an orange, Tom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I filled it with ice. don't know if anyone can see that, but it was filled a minute ago. <laughs> now, now there's not so much icing. So this isn't going quite as I'd planned. Um, but we, you, you suggested that we put 50 mil of the... Uh, and I've got a, a pouch just like everyone at home. Um, these are difficult to open, aren't they, Ben? 50 ml of the uh, vermouth. Um, and it goes into, into this. So far, no spillage. I and think your grapefruit's too small. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's way too small. <laughs> and then not the first time I've heard that. Uh, <laughs> I'm using a dry gin. I'm using the um, Sipsmith, which we actually had in a uh, previous tasting. Yeah, we did it in a in the actual distillery. Look at that! It's actually fitting. Don't don't doubt me. Well, it uh, must soak in a bit. There must be a soaking element. No, this is, it's, must... it's, it's going to be disastrous, Ben. Don't, don't you, I, oh this, no! Okay. I think there's loads more to come in. Oh yeah, god. Okay, uh, there's a sugar syrup, just a little dash of that. Yeah, let go easy on the sugar syrup. <laughs> yeah. And some freshly squeezed grapefruit juice from said grapefruit. And <laughs> it's done. Look at oh. that. Look. Ow. Yeah. How does I it think taste? You should, I think you should maybe not be wearing a white t shirt. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, that's all right. I think I'll go away with that. Hmm. I'll tell yeah. you for why. I'll tell you for why. Because it's mostly the vermouth. Because I had to go easy on the other ingredients. Lovely. Actually, with the grapefruit, that bitterness really offsets some of the sweetness in the vermouth. Um, that is actually quite tasty. But one of the things that I was doing when I was playing around with um, your lovely vermouths was I went back to London Essence which we talked about last week um, as a mixer, and their grapefruit soda works brilliantly with the vermouth just in um, a long drink. So if you have that with some ice um, in a highball glass, um, who likes highballs, Ben? Giraffes. <laughs> Brace yourself, everyone. We're writing that joke into the show. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to pull the rest of my... Vermouth. I don't know if they... Yeah, they have them. I don't know if they like them. Female giraffes. Females like them. That's a bit, not, right, not not a bit of them. It's a massive generalisation. But... <laughs> That's what I've done. I've just topped it up. With the... And that is... That was how easy that was compared to my rather elaborate grapefruit. Oh, I like it. I like it. A cocktail in a fruit. Hmm. It does actually taste really nice. It's getting better as well as... But that was that was a bit easier, and I don't know whether grapefruit was in your thinking, Janina, in terms of um, uh, pairing. But it does seem to go remarkably well with it. I suppose you've already got the oranges in there, so that's just anything citrusy is going to um, be lifted in, in if you mix it with a citrus drink. But I think, see, I think this was well because uh, could go after. Um, I'm not having it, it's, well, I poured it at the beginning of the tasting, so it's quite warm now, which means you're getting a lot more of the flavours, but it's not the chilled aperitif that you'd probably want. But if you had that with some cheese instead of a port, I think it works brilliantly well. Port is one of those things that um, 
I was thinking it's a bit pokey at the end. It makes me feel like I'm, every time I sip it, it feels like I'm getting gout. I've never had gout, but but this seems a lot less, yeah, it's not. It's just not as uh, intense in terms of that alcoholic content. And I think I'd go brilliantly with with some 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 English cheeses. Yeah. Uh, Paul, oh, Paul, Paul, Paul's yeah. just said a joke. Paul's just said a joke. What's the difference between a digger and a giraffe? What was one's the got answer? hydraulics. One's got high. Oh, very good. Um, but there was a question earlier about food. Um, yes. So in terms of when it comes to pairing these different varieties of vermouth, is there is there any guidance you can give us on food, Janina? What would you suggest having with each? Um, okay, so because the vermouth is quite... Uh, wine led you could just do the same thing that you would do with the wine version if that makes sense so like the dry white vermouth will go with all the same things that a crisp white wine would go with so like um fish dishes um maybe a little bit of cheese chicken dishes uh it goes with things that are quite rich as well to help sort of like lighten that up a little bit um i did a normandy chicken dish back in sort of February time when you know we all wanted really good warm comfort food and I basically just switched the brandy out for the vermouth and sort of almost cooked the chicken in a bit of vermouth and then I paired it with vermouth whilst I was eating it I felt very cultured um but it was also really it was lovely it was really nice um so that's that's definitely something I would highly recommend and actually I think the recipe is on the website uh, for the red, definitely, like you said, Ben, you could very easily match it with cheese, like you would a port. So when I do my events and I do my meet the maker sessions and whatever, when I'm trying to explain vermouth to people in a few sentences, I normally would say to people, the red is like a port. It's lighter for sure. And it's not as sweet, um, but you can match it and, you know, use it in much the same way. Uh, so yeah, sort of cheese. It's got a sweetness that I would say wouldn't, would mean it wouldn't necessarily work with meat dishes I mean it's not that's not my sort of thing um and also with the vanilla in there and the tonka beans I think that might be a bit much you might be able to get away with pairing it with a not so sweet dessert so um mm. I don't know maybe something with a like a crumble that's not too sweet or uh something like that might work quite well mm. but yeah I think cheese is, is the absolute winner what's, what's the dish what's the uh, sauce you get with uh, uh duck is it is it cherry no what's the uh what well, uh, the orange sauce no there's duck like a... raw, yes but then there's there's another it comes uh oh. Well, almost like a hoisin or... in fact. Plum, not plums. Someone said plums. But there is a cherry sauce. There's up in, in fact, near where we were in Provence, there's a village like that's famous for its cherries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they do do with actually do a sauce with, with duck and other meats. They use it on uh, it's quite a... I'm just gonna So yeah, is that what you're thinking? Reducing the vermouth down into some sort of sauce. To... Like a yes, like a jus. Oh. Okay. Uh, a reduction. Well, is, is double sieved, so you you know you have to say that's what defines the shoe. You have to pass Ooh, it. Oh, okay. No, no, you, you, you just yeah. found me out there. I don't know. What, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm talking about. But still. <laughs> but you know, there's that. There's the there's the cherry. It is a cherry. It's like a. It's almost like a red curry. It's but it's got it's a bit more tart. So maybe. Mm. Anyway. Just an idea. There's no bad ideas yeah. in the room, guys. Come on. No, there's no such thing as bad idea. I mean, it is. No. It's got that fruitiness that means you could easily, yeah, use it like you would a, a cherry thing or, yeah. you know. So yeah, no, get where you're coming from. But no, I think uh, cheese is really the the mm. ultimate thing. Um, I did last year make when it was hot. I made some sort of um, like slushy, slushy things like alcoholy slushy things with them uh that was delicious it was super easy i think i literally just put it in the freezer i can't remember now uh Ooh. yeah there's, there's 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 stuff you can do um okay, so what's one, one, one of the questions on the on oh, the yeah. chat is what's a discount code for in the uh, loop um now for some reason i i'm online but it doesn't seem to be um i can't get the discount code where where is it it's, um, on, uh, it's 20 yes yeah, it's, it's it's on there just on the on the magazine. Oh, we'll find it, guys. Hang on. All you have to do is go here and apply the code Think Drinkers. 
That sounds about right. Think drinkers or thinking drinkers? I've got it in the now. Wait a minute. You it says can... think drinkers on here, and it's twenty percent discount on all the super duper vermouths. So yeah, it's yeah. well, it's think, uh, think drink twenty. It's think for. drink twenty. I'm terribly uh, sorry, guys. Think drink twenty. We'll change that on the website so all the people. Yeah, who I'll put it on there. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, uh, Barn, 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 Barns has done it. Well done, Barnes. Um, but it's cap, caps, I think. Well, they might okay. might need it. And that's till uh, the end of the week, isn't it? Yeah, so it's till Sunday night. So I've mm. given you uh, the rest of the week. So round it off nicely Sunday night. Exactly. Um, nice. Someone was converted to the grapefruit drink. I just like to say, if you want to, we'll make this video available so you can see how, how to make it properly. Um, <laughs> it looks a, a lot of people things. couldn't carry that look out off Tom. I mean, it's I really amazing. Know, but it's sipping out the grapefruit. So what's next in terms of uh, wines yeah. and flavours? What can we expect to see next? Do you Are you thinking about going in radical directions or... Are there new uh, grapes that you're particularly keen to try and explore? Um, uh, to be honest, I'm pretty happy with the range as it is. Uh, I've done a lot of development to get it this far. Uh, I've got a few products that I want to tweak a bit further. That is the perfectionist in me. Um, and also just going off of people's feedback. So I do a lot of events and there's nothing quite like having somebody right in front of you pulling a face to tell you that you might need to change something. So there's a few little things I want to tweak. Um, but really the next step for me is actually trying to get out there a little bit more. Uh, so just I've been making nuisance of myself, talking to lots of people and trying to get more people to try the stuff and, you know, yeah. tell their friends. Drink loads of it. I don't know. At the end of the day, vermouth isn't particularly well known in the UK. It's really big in France, Italy, Spain, because they've got such an old wine culture, right? So vermouth is an offshoot of wine. And as the English wine industry is quite young still, then it would be logical that vermouth would also be at the beginning stages. We've got a lot of work to do. It's really nice for me to see other English vermouth producers popping up. Um, so I started the business a few years ago when I created the business and I sold shares to raise investment. I argued with my investors that we would start to see more vermouth producers popping up and it has happened. So I was right on that. And it's actually really nice to see. I mean, my husband sort of said, oh, you know, they're competition. I was like, no, but they're not I actually, know. because the more of us get the word out, I mean, if it gets to the point where there's 2,500 vermouth makers in the UK, like there's 2,500 ginger distilleries, we might have a bit of an issue. But for the moment, <laughs> You know, I think we're, we're good. So I just wanted to get the word out there a little bit more, uh, maybe develop my cocktail range a bit more. Um, so I've got the vermouth range, which obviously you guys have tried tonight. Can I show them what the cocktail yeah, range yes. is? Yes, yeah, 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 right. yeah, okay. We'll just do this really quickly. So here we go. Uh, this is the lemon sherbet martini. So this uses Brighton gin, dry white vermouth, and a load of fresh lemon peel. So um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with this one. That's what the bottle looks like. And that you would literally just chill it and serve it as it is. Um, or have it over uh, uh, lots of ice. We have our ready to drink Negroni. So this is not your average mm. Negroni Lovely. because everyone can mix gin, vermouth and Campari. I don't need to do that and bottle it for you. So mine has got fresh and bitter orange peel in it. Uh, so I've done like a fresh maceration. I was peeling oranges for an awfully long time. <laughs> um, but this, you would literally just have it over ice with a fresh slice of orange, like you would a Negroni. So again, Brighton Gin, it's got my semi-sweet red vermouth in it. Um, and yeah, fresh and bitter orange. So you get that bitterness from the orange peel, the bitter orange peel. It's like, it was almost like an orange tea uh, rather than Campari with those complex orange notes. I'm quite happy with that. And then this one's a bit weird and unusual. It was a lot of fun to make. It's a rum hatton. So it's like a take on a Manhattan. So instead of using whiskey, you've used a dark rum. The dark rum is delicious. It's made by Two Drifters Distillery, which are based in Devon. They're a carbon negative distillery. So it's just been B Corp certified. And their signature dark rum is really delicious. It's got a very nice burnt sugar note on it that just for me, as a previous non-rum drinker, has really converted me to the rum cause. Uh, I've mixed some dry white vermouth in there. It's got a load of uh, vanilla in it and enough sugar just to take the edge off the rum. This recently won a silver award. It's nice and shiny. Mm, there we go. Medal. Um, yeah, it was the, thank you, thank you. It was the spirits business and the drinks business did a spring tasting. 
And again, I think, like I said to you guys, you know, Ben and Tom earlier, I only sort of enter into competitions where I really feel like there's some weight behind them and there's some real merit in actually winning the award. So it was very happy to win that. And obviously, my Vermouth has recently joined the ranks of award winning products. So, yeah. yeah. I, IWSC, no less, which, as we all know, Ben, is, uh, is an award worth having since yeah. I also have one. I know. Yeah. It's all the coolest people have got. Cool. Have you got one, Ben? Oh, no. oh, I mean, uh, it's a bit awkward, isn't it, Tom? <laughs> Never mind. He is Beer Writer of the Year three times running, youngest ever recipient. See how that just trips off my tongue? I've said it so many times. Um, uh, yeah, well, congratulations on the, all the awards. I mean, it is really very tasty stuff. I think uh, there's been a lot of a lot of comments and a lot of questions. I, I, I would hazard, Ben, more than any other tasting we've had, in fact. Yeah. Two well, they've all are in Brookhaven. Called, called, called Wormwood Scrubs. Yeah, that's good. Uh, the, vermouth, the vermouth slushy is a great idea. We are going to be down in Exeter with our show, so we will have to check those guys out, two drifters. Um, yeah, they do the signature rum. They've got a spiced pineapple rum. Uh, Ooh, yeah, yeah they've got some that. interesting stuff. Honestly, you need to go and speak to them. Well, we can, yeah. Perhaps we could go down there, get a couple of theirs in, in the, one of the tasting and your cocktail so people can taste yeah. it. Yeah, I could do an um, intro if you want. You'll have to yeah, send me an yeah. email. I think people would like, a, certainly a pineapple rum sounds very interesting. Um, aside from um, this form, how do British drinks such as Janina get such pre superb, premium, superb products out there in a way that protects the integrity and the brand? That's a good question. Um, and from our experience of launching a premium British product in our hobo beer, Ben, <laughs> <laughs> our, our experience of it, and you might be able to back this up, you've got to do a lot of walking around, right? Janina, you've actually got to... You've got to actually take those products into places that you trust and then you rely a bit on word of mouth. Is that mm -hmm. fair? Yeah, it is. It's um, as I've learned, it's cherry picking the right places that are going to do justice mm -hmm. to your product in the way that they sell them. But also um, I'm at a point now where I'm starting to think about if I want to grow the business. And if that happens, it will be me selecting somebody that will work in the same way that I would. Not necessarily someone that has the right skills or experience, but someone that has the right personality and willing to learn. I think that's something that's really important when you're hiring someone. Um, I was recently um, listening to a talk by Ellie Webb, who's the founder of Kalenio, which is a non-alcoholic uh, spirit brand. And she said something that really resonated with me, which was you need to find someone that can work in the business so you can work on the business. Um, and it's about finding the right person. So that's how you kind of would then protect your brand. Because at the end of the day, at this moment in time, the brand is me. I've built this from scratch. And everything that I love about the world is in my products. And everything that I've learned is in my products. So to take it forward and to grow it means to continue to have those core values. So I need to find the right person to help kind of um, yeah, do that for me in my absence. If I was starting to, uh, someone else said, um, move the rocks, not the sand. You start sort of looking bigger picture and you, you start focusing on moving one rock instead of shoveling loads of sand. Um, so yeah, it's about finding the right person so I can start moving yeah. rocks. You've got to be careful because so sometimes you end up with the wrong person, don't you, Ben? And uh, then, <laughs> and then the business just goes in a circle, <laughs> and you have to take your clothes off on stage, and things don't go the way you'd hope they'd go. Yeah. There's a question there about a non-alcoholic vermouth. Um, that not, baffles me. That honestly, yeah, that I'm whole concept. Really. Um, it's like this whole idea of a non-alcoholic spirit. Just the the legal side of it really throws me because, like with vermouth. There are certain things you have to you have to tick the box. It's got to be at least seventy five percent wine. Is it seventy five or eight percent? Eighty five. Seventy five percent wine. Seventy five percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to have one as one of its botanical. But anyway, but the key thing is, if it's a non alcoholic vermouth, it's not going to be seventy five percent wine. It doesn't matter how you look at it, mm. unless you were to dealcoholize it and then try to put the botanical flavour in afterwards. But I mean, God, I mean, it's I wouldn't cordial, do that. Isn't it? it would just be a cordial essentially yeah, yeah. It, would be, it would be like all this other stuff i'm not saying that it's not nice no. stuff mm. all the non-alcoholic stuff but it is essentially <laughs> very nice flavored water yeah 
it's nice. It's a, really, it's, a, it's a debate. It's a debate that we were we probably won't get into right now. Someone's just asked whether there there is such a thing or can be such a thing. Uh, to give to give a very quick overview on it, we discussed putting non-alcoholic drinks in these pouches, but we thought that was cheating people a bit um, because this is an alcohol tasting experience. Um, so. There is a lot of emperor's new clothes in the world of non-alcoholic at the moment. And there are some people who are doing genuinely innovative and interesting things in that space. But um, yeah, it's calling things non-alcoholic spirits is a bit. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Uh, yeah, uh, and non-alcoholic vermouth has that same kind of, but also from my point of view, having tried to sell vermouth for the last few years, that for me is yeah. a bit like a niche in a niche. Yeah. It feels a bit too niche. You know, yeah. I mean, that's going to be hard. It's like, non it's like, okay, well, what's the mousse? And then how is it non alcoholic It's like, my mind would explode. You know, yeah. I think it's too much. No, yeah. I think I think people can get their heads around the gin thing because they understand what gin is. And, and it's, but it's, I think, I think what the issue with the non alcoholic or not the issue, but the, um, it's about hitting a moment, isn't it? It's sometimes you want, you want something refreshing you want a reward, and sometimes that can be alcoholic, most of the time. Other times, for various reasons, it probably could do with being non-alcoholic. But you you want that that occasion. And if you can swap an alcoholic drink for a non-alcoholic drink and still get a, that, a relatively similar sense of satisfaction or reward or whatever you're, you're, you're craving, then, then great. But to just to take every different spirit or concept to go this would work without alcohol in it that's not that's i think that's the wrong way of approaching it um mm. that's the uh, that, opposite, that, of that, that that's five the opposite of hydraulics isn't it ben <laughs> it's, it is it is the opposite of hydraulics um well, not the opposite but well, no it's just a different word yes <laughs> the rhymes it's bollocks, so I mean, that's not, it's easy just to say it. Um, okay, it's created a good debate, absolutely, and there is more to be had on it. Uh, for the time being, I think if we send, any, if we send anything non-alcoholic to you, our members, it will be one of three, and the other two will still be alcoholic, and then we can have that debate, um, but, uh, but not a mass debate, no. Well done, well done. Someone, had, someone said it. I mean, I've been fighting it for ever since I said the word debate. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I think that's a good place to draw this to a close. Uh, Janina, thank you so much for your time. Really, thank you. Um, that's It's been fascinating because it is, as Ben said right at the beginning there, this is a category that we absolutely love. We want to champion as well. Um, but it's quite difficult for people to get their heads around it. Now that you're doing something that is being made here and we're understanding English wine is improving in quality and becoming more available, I think you've got an opportunity here to, to sell the story better than the Italians or the French um, or the Germans or the Australians who are all having a crack at this market. So um, we're definitely big fans. Um, and it's lovely, lovely stuff. It really yeah. is lovely. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You, um, no, um, I appreciate that a lot. But it's not just me. I've been... Well, you need to send me quite a lot of it, and I, there's not much of it left. Even after <laughs> I sent it to all you lot. And you're so, the um, mates. <laughs> no, no, I've just... It's just been sat alone, yeah. drinking and watching box sets. No, no it's, it's, it's a perfect moment. It's very so cultured and sophisticated. <laughs> not when you're sat in your pyjamas. But okay. <laughs> Just... huh? All right. Well, well, thank you very much, guys. Yeah. Janine, uh, thank you very if, much. Um, if anyone any has questions, any questions, email us, uh, um, and we'll pass them on to Janine if need be. Um, thinking, uh, what's what was the code again? Get think, on. The, get on think, think, drink, drink, twenty. Capital T, capital D. Get involved. Uh, they're already great value, but get them even mm. better. And um, and we'll we're sending out a newsletter on Thursday, so keep an eye out for that, guys. And we'll send we'll be putting the video out as well. And I think next month, Tom, what have we got next month? Next month, live. Uh, we've got live from it. Yeah, so it's gonna to prepare you already uh, with my telescopic spoon. 
Uh, it will be later. It will be uh, after, certainly after eight, because we're in Edinburgh for the whole month. We're performing our show at the Edinburgh Fringe. So we're going to be doing a tasting. Either we're going to have to pre-record it or we can do it after with Johnny Walker whiskies. So, um, yeah, they've got a big... So not, as big as Medina, not as big as in the loop, but sometimes you've got <laughs> to champion the small guys, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it'll be different. I don't, yeah. Anyway, that's what's happening. Uh, just to pre-warn everyone, it's looking very stormy here. I think I think things are about to break. Um, so I'm going to go off and finish my vermouth. Yeah, I'm going to bring in my pants from the uh, washing line. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Janina. And uh, and uh, anyone who didn't anyone who didn't get the pouches, email us and we'll send them out uh, with the next batch. And apologies, okay. but it is the post office's fault, not mine. Okay. All right. Okay. Love you, Love you everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.